Story number one, a coup. For almost a decade, the security state, the FBI, and later the Central Intelligence Agency essentially served as a disinformation workshop for Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee. It's undeniable with the release of John Durham's report that the FBI attempted to swing a presidential election in the United States of America. Election interference. John Durham's long-awaited report has been released, and the revelations are absolutely stunning. Do not listen to the talking point of the mainstream media, much as we heard when it came to the pandemic of the unvaccinated or a threat to democracy. The talking point has gone out. The verbal ticks have been crystallized. The mainstream media is uttering the phrase, nothing burger. They're saying that Durham's report amounts to nothing. As you can always expect when there's a talking point that has been issued, the opposite is true. The Durham report is, when it comes to a revelation of the truth, a bombshell. What it shows is a coordinated attempt within the FBI that laid the predicate later for the CIA to attempt to install Hillary Clinton and then later Joe Biden as the president of the United States. Let's walk through it together. First, what John Durham, the special counsel, uh, pointed to look into Crossfire Hurricane, the allegations that President Donald Trump and then candidate Donald Trump were in collusion with Russia. Durham launched his investigation into what led this faulty investigation, Crossfire Hurricane. What it shows is that leading up to the summer of 2016, there was absolutely, in a direct quote, no actual evidence, nothing to support the idea. No one even had the kernel of an inkling that Donald Trump was in collusion with Russia. And then in the summer of 2016, everything changed. Within about a day, Australian intelligence had passed along in a pub meeting in London the idea that George Papadopoulos, a advisor to the Trump campaign, had suggested they had dirty information on Hillary Clinton through Russia. This was hearsay through some Australian diplomats that made its way to the FBI. It's interesting and important to note here standards and practices of investigations by our state security service. Normally, what would happen, and Durham lays this out in his report, is FBI agents would conduct interviews. They would do background research. They would attempt to verify a lead. They would look for corroboration. And in fact, that was the case before they ever heard of George Papadopoulos, before they even had the idea of Trump in Russia. For example, there was intel coming into the FBI and the state security services that Hillary Clinton was looking to sully Donald Trump's reputation with allegations of connection to Russia. There was no evidence. There was no idea. But there was an idea. There was evidence that Hillary might do something like this. Why? Well, if you'll remember, with Hillary's emails having been leaked or have been exposed as existing on an unclassified server, having you know, broken protocols for classified material and then leaked into the public, what was exposed was a coordinated, not just attempt or effort, but successful mission for the DNC to rig their primary election against Bernie Sanders and in favor of Hillary Clinton. So there's Clinton sitting in the midst of this scandal and set to go up against Donald Trump. And what she does, as is so often the case that we have seen with projection, you know, those who are racist call others racist. Those who are gay call others homophobic. As is always the case, she projects her sins onto her soon-to-be political opponent. She seeds the idea. She's prepared to seed the idea that Donald Trump is compromised. And the FBI learns this. In fact, it's briefed in the White House to then-President Barack Obama, then-Vice President Joe Biden, the Attorney General, and other high-level members of government. They knew Hillary Clinton could do something like this, and they didn't launch an investigation. But when it came to this random pub hearsay,
from an Australian diplomat when it comes to Donald Trump. They launched an investigation within a day, one day. Now, why? Why would they do away with their standard protocols? Why would they not investigate? Why would they handle this differently than they did with an investigation into Hillary Clinton? And the answer is because the FBI, like so many, had it in for Donald Trump. That was revealed in the Durham report where you see text messages between, for example, Lisa Page and the head of counterintelligence at the FBI, Peter Strzok. You can see texts where they're like watching the Republican primary debates. They're watching Donald Trump. They're saying, oh, my God, he's horrific. You know, maybe like some of your relatives and some of your friends, you're familiar with the text. He's a bore. He's terrible. He's horrific. And there's one text in particular that caught my attention. Page texts struck. Oh, my God. He's not really going to become president, is he? And Strzok responds, no, no way. We'll stop it. That right there should scream across every headline. The head of counterintelligence of the FBI publishes a text, no, no way. We'll stop it. Stunning. And within a day, at the slightest bit of hearsay, he had his predicate to go attempt to stop Donald Trump. I want to stop here and step away from the details. It can get complicated, and we're going to walk through it and try to lay it out in the most digestible manner, but it can get complicated. Names, who's this guy, who's that guy, FBI, convolution, uh, self-feeding mechanism, a a snake eating its tail. But in the end, this is, I think, what we have to understand. Greg Gutfeld laid it out very well on The Five on Monday on the Fox News Channel. One thing that's undeniable is that for those that hate Donald Trump, they considered him an existential threat to democracy. They've laid it out. They've said as much. It's not just that he's horrible or horrific in their estimation. It's that he's Hitler. It's the death of democracy. He's a threat to our democracy. And because you believe that, not only are you willing, but it would be heroic for you to break the rules, to lie, to smear, to run disinformation campaigns to break laws, to do anything, to take down Hitler. If you have cast yourself in the play, a play of an existential crisis, it's a threat to the existence of the United States of America, what would you do? Better asked, what wouldn't you do? It's like that internet debate. If you could go back in history and you were sitting there, would you kill baby Hitler? It's like this interesting morality conundrum that people put to one another. But he's just a baby. He hasn't done anything wrong yet. But you know who he will be. They saw Trump, no matter how delusional, no matter how wrong, they saw Trump in essence as Hitler. And so there's Peter Strzok, the head of counter intel at FBI. Fancy title, but in the end, no different than your aunt who thinks Trump is a threat to democracy. From there, here's what happens. With that scant evidence on George Papadopoulos, they begin to open up FISA warrants and intel and surveillance on the Trump campaign. Hillary Clinton's campaign, who is, in essence, trying to run opposition research on Donald Trump, does the following. She hires a law firm. It's called Perkins Coie. Perkins Coey then in turn hires, and these kind of entities are all over the political landscape, an opposition research fund called Fusion GPS. Fusion GPS then hires an ex-British spy named Christopher Steele to go out there and see what they can dig up on Donald Trump. Blank slate, nothing to run on, except the idea that Trump is connected to Russia. Christopher Steele then puts together what is to become the infamous Steele dossier. The Steele dossier contains in it allegations, we'll go through a couple of the most salacious, for example, that Donald Trump in a hotel in Moscow, Russia, peed on some hookers and got pissed on by some hookers. That'll grab your attention. That'll lead Rachel Maddow. That'll drive ratings. That'll lead the New York Times. Where did he get this idea? That Donald Trump had a PP party in Russia. He got that from a Russian named Igor Danchenko, who's not much of anybody. 
He's a Russian in America. I think at one time he worked for the Brookings Institute. He wasn't a spook. He wasn't a spy. He didn't work for the KGB that we know of, although I think he got investigated back in 08 or 09 of whether or not he was a Russian spook. He's nobody. In fact, it didn't even come from Danchenko. Danchenko, in fact, talked to a guy at a hotel who told him the PP story. Who was that guy? Another name, but pay attention, a guy named Charles Dolan. Charles Dolan took a tour of, what was the name of the hotel in Russia? I don't know. Was it the Radisson, the Four Seasons, Fancy Pants? He said, hey, will you show me the presidential suite? They go, yeah, this is the presidential suite. He learns that's where Donald Trump stayed. No doorman, nobody. We find out through the Durham investigation. Ever told Dolan the PP story? Who's Dolan? Well, Charles Dolan is a DNC operative. He worked for Bill Clinton's campaigns both times. He worked for Hillary Clinton at one time. You see the snake eating his tail? Charles Dolan makes up a story, passes it to Igor Danchenko, who passes it to Christopher Steele, who passes it to Fusion GPS, back to Perkins Coie, and back to the Hillary Clinton campaign. And that's not the only example. Here's another fascinating example. Perkins Coie attorney Michael Sussman decides he needs to create something against Donald Trump. Perkins Coie has another client. It's a data research fund connected to some colleges here in the United States. A guy named Joffe runs it. And this is revealed in the Durham report. They go to this data firm and say, hey, can you backtrack some data and create a narrative that there's a connection between Donald Trump and Russia? That's it. You know what they say? There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Wait till you get into internet data. And so what they do is they find this internet data and they create a narrative from it. That there's this bank called Alpha Bank that serves as a back channel between the Trump campaign and Russia. Next thing you know, Perkins Coie shops this idea to everyone under the sun. The New York Times, MSNBC, and they don't run with it yet because they're like, this doesn't completely make sense. And then Michael Sussman, attorney for Hillary Clinton, goes to James Baker at the FBI. He does not tell Baker, I'm working for Hillary Clinton. In fact, he denies that he's working for a candidate. And he says, check out this stuff. I found this back channel. I think you should know. And the FBI doesn't really bite. And he says, well, you should know the media's looking at this. You don't want to let them get ahead of you. He says, what media? Sussman says the New York Times. What does the FBI do? What does Baker do? They call the New York Times and say, don't run that. We need to look into this. And then giving the idea that it's under investigation. New York Times runs it, says it's under investigation, which it wasn't before the idea that New York Times was going to run it. MSNBC runs it. Now you got pundits and Maddows all over the place going, look at these confusing connections. I was working at ESPN running the Will Cain show on ESPN Radio, and I'd look up at the TV and go, what the hell is going on? I can't understand any of this because the confusion was the point. And Maddow had a crazy ratings by turning it, the confusion into a story. But it again was the snake eating its tail. Clinton and her firm creating a story through another data firm, feeding it to the media, which they also pitched it to the FBI, which together decided it's a story. And the minute you can say, hey, something's under investigation, it has the patina of credibility. Oh, it's under investigation. Trump must have been connected to Russia. Must have peed on some hooker. And yet there's nothing there's no, in, there's no evidence. There's no corroboration. There's no secondary source. There's nothing. Why? That's not how the FBI should, or in most cases, does operate. But the answer to why is that James Comey, head of the FBI, and Peter Strzok, and half a dozen to a dozen others, saw Donald Trump as Hitler. And so they were willing to set aside standards and practices. But not just that. Rest on fake evidence. The story isn't that there was no actual evidence. The story is they created fake evidence. A hoax. And attempted to swing an American election for president. That's your state security services against the will of the people. It didn't work in 2016. Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. But this entire 
saga, this soap opera, commandeered almost three years of his presidency. It drug this country into a war along with our race issues pitted against itself. Your aunt, my neighbor, all believed that Donald Trump was not just a horrible person, but a threat to America. And Russia was the big bad guy behind him. That led us to the easy excuse to take sides in a proxy war in Ukraine, where we sit now possibly on the brink of a nuclear war. Because why? Because Russia. But really, is it because Russia? Or is it because, like everything else for seven years, Donald Trump? And here's the thing. What the Durham report reveals is, yes, it was all a fake. It was a fugazi. It was a wazi. It was a woozy. It's nothing. But what it really shows you is not only was it fake, and not only shows you that no one was ever held accountable, but it shows you that they got rich. All those guys, those names I've just told you, the main reason you may not watch it, know them, is you don't watch MSNBC. Them dudes are famous. They got contributor contracts. They're out there with employment based upon these lies. Not only were they unaccountable, they got bank. And there's one more thing. They got emboldened. Because it didn't stop with the FBI. They ran the same playbook in 2020 to elect Joe Biden. They got 51 intel agency experts to dismiss Hunter Biden's laptop as Russian disinformation, again, a fake, a fugazi, to swing a presidential election. And this time, it worked. It worked in 2020. We are played. We are pawns. We've been had. Those that tell you that the biggest threat to democracy is their opponent are the threats to democracy. Those that tell you that everybody's racist, I am 100% convinced, are the racists. Those that tell you they are good and noble and heroic are your enemy. I'm here to tell you that they will do it again. Because your aunt, my neighbor, they'll never hear the story of the Durham report. They'll call it a nothing burger. They'll say you're in a cult. And just like with everything else, It'll be them that's in the cult. It takes a lot of belief in humanity, belief that I retain. I am an optimist. Have to be. Have to be an optimist. It takes a lot of belief in humanity to think somehow, some way, it will break through. The truth. In the end, that's what matters. Not whether or not Republicans or Democrats win. Not Donald Trump. Not even the FBI and whether or not we're corrupt and compromised. Not whether our state security services have gone the way of Eastern Europe. But whether or not we will ever firmly again stand on objective reality. Whether or not there will ever be a victory for the truth. Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.